Soft Stories Live features guests who are often decades removed from an operation, so the stories are told as they remember them and are not cleared for release by the Department of Defense. All content discussed is unclassified and or publicly released by the DOD prior to this broadcast. Our intent is to share these moments in history as experienced by the special operators who were there. Good afternoon. I'm Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force retired, former Air Commando, and the host for today's Topic 7, JTF 510 Operation Enduring Freedom Philippines. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm introducing Sergeant Major Retired, U.S. Army Retired Mike Bosco. He retired from the U.S. Army in 2012 as a Sergeant Major with extensive operational experience with the U.S. Special Operations Command. With assignments ranging from the 75th Ranger Regiment, the 160th SOAR, and other special mission units. Mike served as the NCIC for the SOCPAC SOJ 25 Joint Intelligence Support Element. During JTF 510, during Operation Enduring Freedom Philippines, Mike served as the collection manager for assigned ISR assets. Mike, would you please introduce today's distinguished guests? Thanks, Randy. Thanks to the Global Soft Foundation for supporting uh, stories like these in the living history uh, of, of Soft. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to welcome this uh, this, this amazing panel of uh, guests of uh, special operations warriors and military intelligence professionals. First, I want to introduce Lieutenant General Donald Wooster, U.S. Air Force retired, a seasoned special operations air commander flying multiple aircraft types, having served over 38 years in commanding at all levels, to include being a former uh, commanding general of uh, Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, General Wooster, I first met General Wooster when he was the commanding general for Special Operations Command, where he commanded from October uh, 2000 uh, to February 2003. Uh, and later, General Wooster would serve as the commander for J Joint Task Force 510 during Operation Enduring Freedom Philippines there. General Wooster, welcome, sir. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to, uh, to see you today. Um, next, I mean, again, we have living legends here. Lieutenant General David Friedovich, U.S. Army retired, is a legendary Green Beret with over 37 years uh, of service in the U.S. Army, commanding at all levels to include company, battalion, group, uh, and, and so forth there. Uh, during OFP is where I first met Lieutenant General Friedovich, then Colonel Friedovich, for the commander of 1st Special Forces Group and the RSOF commander within JTF 510. General Friedovich would later serve as a SOC PAC commanding general from 2005 to 2007. And what better to have not just one SOC PAC commander, but two former SOC PAC commanders on this panel on in there. And finally, as a personal uh, uh, trait to kind of get my former OIC within SOC PAC, Chief Warrant Officer 3 Donald Sikorsky, U.S. Army retired, a true MI professional. I'll tell you what, one of the most brilliant intelligence minds that I got to serve with. He served as a senior all source technician uh, within SOC PAC, over 25 years of service, leading multidisciplinary intelligence team. Don again was the OIC for the SOJ25 within SOC PAC, and he was the all source intelligence lead for JTF 510 during Operation During Green Philippines. And I'll tell you folks, you're going to get no better expert on the ASG and the environment down there uh, that we're going to discuss here today. So gentlemen, it is an extreme pleasure to have you today and great to see you all in good health uh, in these times now. So General Wooster, can I set the stage a little bit and kind of open the discussion to those who may not know what a theater special operations command is and the responsibility you had as a commanding general to the sink then Admiral Blair, later Admiral Fargo, uh, uh, whatnot there. So sir, can you talk us a little bit about a TSOC and your responsibilities as a commander? Sure. Um, each geographic combatant commander has four components, Air, Army, Navy, and Marine. And there's also a subunified command called the Theater Special Operations Command. It is not a component. It's not a service element. It's a joint element. Most of those uh, TSOCs also are standing JTF designates so that if the geographic combatant commander seeks to deploy quickly a joint force, the TSOCs really are uh, resonant to that in each of the theaters. The, the uh, special ops commands also serve as the primary staff element for the regional combatant commander in terms of things that regard uh, special operations and planning and execution exercises and employment. So the TSOC is, is uh, as I said, a subunified command, a joint structure with previously identified forces that organize, train, and rehearse uh, through multiple exercises in their theater to gain expertise, as well as the components beneath them that do that to a greater detail uh, and work all the way down to the tactical level with the host nation partners that we may be working with. So the TSOC is a, 
is a, a unique organization within the military and uh, very effective and, and particularly responsive because it allows, there are a couple of things it allows. A, a combatant commander can get a general officer forward on the ground very quickly. And uh, the TSOCs have extremely robust communications as well as the backside of incredibly capable forces that can deploy at a moment's notice. Thank you, sir, on that. And that's something that's very interesting because I was a newcomer to SOC back post 9-11 and it was really interesting experience there. And PACOM is the largest AOR, air responsibility on the planet. It's got a lot, a lot of uh, geogra ge geography to cover down on. General Friedovich, as a former SOC pack commander, can you tell the audience about JTF 510? What's the background on it, the purpose of it? General Wooster kind of alluded to in having a SAN Joint Task Force, but this was the Joint Task Force for SOC pack. A little background on JTF 510. Uh, 510 uh, being, it, it became a standing as uh, OEF, Philippines and other operations around the globe uh, on the GWAT uh, stood up. It became a standing JTF to do just what General Wooster uh, mentioned be able to fly away, but it normally had, it usually had a uh, uh, really a recovery and a blend into uh, the other subunified command at uh, SOCOM, at JSOC. And that was part of the, the marriage. And everyone, as you know, from UCOM has uh, a theater uh, element that does that. And 510 was the version of this for PACOM. Uh, Donnie Wooster and I had many uh, discussions about what 510's intent was down there, but it was one, a way to get organized and two, to get down there rapidly. Uh, we talked a lot about, and we will talk a lot about the recovery of uh, the Burnhams. Uh, he thought that was number one. My priorities were his priorities, or his priorities actually were my priorities to be quite honest. Uh, but there was a, a bit of a, a difference in culture because I thought we were there to do other things. And we'll talk about that as I get into the assessment. But 510 is the element that has everything you need to rapidly fly away and to be able to get back in and plug into the national forces and the national command authority. Thanks, sir, for that. And again, I think JCF 510 with covering the geography was also huge. You mentioned Hawaii, you know, we're forward based uh, you know, for the, the TSOC headquarters there at SOCPAC being 11 hours from DC, you know, flight time, you know, our component forces in Guam and uh, in Okinawa, you know, being eight hours from us to get into places like Taiwan, Thailand, Philippines, whatnot, was critical uh, having that force structure in place, that command structure to launch there. And General Wooster, I know I launched many times with you eight hours after something to go forward on there and, and being that close to the battle space uh, kind of kind of served its purposes. So J2510, the Senate Task Force was uh, very uniquely placed to kind of uh, serve. Mike, uh, let me add one thing. Uh... Later on with Admiral Fallon, uh, we were able to move MCADs rapidly to go in to put more uh, naval assets in. And he looked at me in his office, and it's kind of amazing. He looked at me in his office, he says, how are you getting the forces and the authority to do this? And I said, sir, we're the subunified command as Donnie Wooster just mentioned. We're 510, we can do this under your authority because we're going into a maritime space we're not asking for anything else. We have the forces at Opera Harbor. We have the forces at Kadena. We have everything we need to do this. We're not asking for anything but your go. And, and he was, I mean, he'd been there in a the seat for a while. He was a little bit dumbfounded, but that's also one of uh, the pieces that 510 is supposed to do, as Donnie said just a little while ago, it's, you know, to train and sometimes you're training your seniors and that's what was happening here. But yeah, you're right. Being that far forward and that quick and that responsive, that is, that is the very essence of 510. Yes, sir. I will, let me add one to that sort of a humorous note. Um, you'd mentioned the time zone differences, Mike. Um, people in the audience, think about when you normally send your sit rep out. End of the day, close it out, maybe one o'clock, ship it off at about 2 a.m. Well, that means it's sitting on the desks in Washington while your boss in Hawaii is asleep. So if they see something they don't like, they're gonna pick the phone up and call him in the middle of the night. Uh, that happened to us once. And then I altered our battle rhythm so that we sent our sit rep out at carpool time in Washington. And it was on my boss's desk at eight o'clock in the morning, which gave him a whole day to work an issue before he heard from Washington. Uh, just an important safety tip to future commanders. That is funny, sir, thank you for that. Uh, 
All right, Don Sikorsky, I want to give us a little flashback. You know, here you are as the all source uh, technician for SOC PAC, looking at the day to day intelligence, providing updates to General Wooster and whatnot. Can you speak to the events in late May of 2001? Because the situation had occurred prior to 9 11 and whatnot and, what, and, and so forth there. Can you talk about what was going on in the Southern Philippines on the 27th of May and why this little island of Barcelona becomes important? Yeah, uh, hey, thanks, Mike. Um, so um, the Southern Philippines has had a history. Um, a long history, actually, of, uh, of issues of dealing with security uh, down in the south. Um, you know, they had the communists up in the north, but they had uh, the, the history with the with the southerns revolved around a couple groups, primarily the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and Abu Sayyaf group. Um, with the, but the North, you know, the Moro Islamic, they're a little bit more conventional. Um, more like a standing presence. They added a, a, they didn't really, there was a sort of like an agreement between them and, and the government of the Philippines. They had their own autonomous region actually. But the ASG, uh, we were primarily at the time, a kidnapped for ransom uh, group, they were operating. They became a lot more terroristic later on. Um, but one of the things they were doing when they were doing kidnapped for ransoms, um, was uh, you know supplementing their their operations uh, through the and, and it it didn't necessarily uh, one of the things we need to remember was they were also kidnapping Filipinos uh, they weren't just uh, targeting Westerners but the significant thing about May and one of the reasons uh, Mr. General Wooster sent me out to the PSAT uh, to the embassy right at the end of May uh, was the Burnham's and uh, Mr. Sobrero. Uh, were kidnapped all the way over in the west off the island of Palawan, which was a significant uh, operation. It really expanded their operational reach. It, this was a, a serious operation. They went all the way out to Palawan, kidnapped them from the Dos Palmas, if I remember right, the Two Palms Resort, and then brought them all the way back uh, to, their, to their sanctuary down there in, uh, in Barcelona. Um, it was quite, uh, quite a reach for them. Um, to to do that, of course they they uh, they ended up um, beheading. It's very gruesome, uh, Mr. Sabrero, um on the way on the way down there. Um, what we didn't know, and I would like to point this out because you know we we look back at it now and we see what the ASG, what we know now about the ASG, and I'm keeping all this unclassified. Um, we for at the time back in 2002. We knew what was going on, not just in the Southern Philippines, it's Sabah, Malaysia, it reached down into Indonesia. However, we didn't know the name of the group Jamaa Islamia. We didn't know its existence. Uh, we didn't know um, that 9-11 uh, 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 hijackers did training in Kuala Lumpur. Um, all that came out in the 9-11 commission report, right? But we didn't know that at the time. Now, there's a great uh, uh, army officer who worked with uh, Wayne Barefoot, a her personal hero of mine. I remember sitting around talking with him about it. And he's like, he, he turned the phrase Islamic archipelago, right? We knew about this threat down in the South. We just didn't know all the connections um, that the ASG had at the time. But we knew the leadership. We, we, we knew out of, the, uh, out of the different groups what their capabilities were, but we just didn't know all the connections and actually um, some of the stuff that uh, General Fridovich will get into the assessments, it's actually a, a lot of good intel uh, came out of those assessments, frankly. But that was a situation uh, back in uh, May 2002. Um, it was a, quite a uh, expanded operational capability they showed when they went to Palawan. Um, it really, it, uh, and it spoke later on uh, to their capabilities when they did stuff with the hostages that, frankly, they, they had never had done before when they moved the hostages back off Boston and worked up the Zambalanga Peninsula. Um, but that, that, that's, what, that's what the situation was in, in May 2002. Thanks, Don. So again, situation is already brewing pre-9-11. 9-11 occurs, sir. Um, and you know the the ramp up to get JTF 510 and, and action in the Philippines uh, starts going. And that's what we go into the, the the format of our, our our discussion here. So so sir, JTF 510 approved for OEFP around Decemberish. We started deploying forces in January. I remember I was on the second C17 that landed. Just sort of a funny anecdote. We landed into EAB. 
like we landed the buy app, you know, in the, like in 2005, when I landed the buy one time, it was a like combat, you know, landing on in there. I remember we had a Hemet on the, Don, you might remember this, had a Hemet on the uh, aircraft with us and it moved like three inches when we landed in EAB on in there. So second plane landing in there with the task force, you know, start uh, alert marshal deploy forces. So it goes into, you know, the model and how to win. What, what, what was, you know, what was the plan and kind of your guidance of kind of success? Sure. Let me talk a little bit about the environment first. Uh, the country had been attacked in September, and uh, SOCPAC had already uh, executed one still classified uh, activity before January. And uh, so we built the plan. Frito and I uh, assembled a plan, which was we we're going to send forces in there. They were going to ramp up. We, we, we were constrained by a number of things. And, and this is an important thing for the leadership of a deployment like this to understand. You are gonna be dealt a hand and that's the hand you're gonna to have to play. And our hand had uh, limitations on the number of people, had limitations on where those people could be, had limitations on where we were allowed to go, uh, had rule of engagement uh, limitations that uh, required us to only act, uh, uh, use weapons in self-defense, self-defense, in the Philippine mindset being you're getting shot at, you can shoot back, not preventive self-defense. Um, there was a time limit for uh, how long we could be there. And uh, we were constrained from conducting any unilateral operations. Um, these were in negotiation between then Secretary of State Powell and the Philippine government. And the Philippine, uh, uh, Philippines are a proud people and their sovereignty meant a great deal to them. And they have, uh, you know, normal, uh, difficult politics as we are experiencing. And so there were always people more than happy to uh, point fingers or throw stones at what the, op the opposite party was willing to do. And so the question is, within those limitations, how are you going to conduct an operation to win? And your country expects you to win. That, that's the bottom line. They expect you to win in accordance with our laws our culture, our priorities, and our humanitarian concerns. And so we took a look at this and said, are we gonna approach it as foreign internal defense? Are we gonna do it as a counterinsurgency? Um, are we gonna do it in a manhunting role? How, how do we think we should uh, pursue this in terms of strategy? And what we settled on, bring up the first slide if you would. What we settled on was a fairly uh, simple strategy and I will cover it and then Frito will discuss the demographics of Basilon. And then uh, his assessment, if you only take one thing away from this, it is that pick a strategy that will work and then find out what you should do to win before you just start doing things helter skelter. Next slide. We had several models that we could choose from. This is a very simple counterinsurgency model. And remember that in 2001, the army did not have official documentation on counterinsurgency. It was not until 2005 that General Petraeus uh, resurfaced the counterinsurgency model, but fortunately, the Green Beret community uh, were the keepers of the flame in this. And so the model that we chose, because I wanted something that everybody on the deployment can understand, whether you're a security guy at the gate or you're uh, uh, an airman working overhead or a uh, uh, seal working with counterparts so, and the Green Berets, this is bred into them. But the three points of the triangle represent the people, the government, and the bad guys. And so the question is, on the top left corner there, how do you enhance the relationship between the people and the government? And so we needed to know what should we do to connect the people to their government? And then along the bottom line of operation, how do we help the government appropriately uh, respond to the terrorists and through military training and expertise. This was the area that was primary, primarily Frito's job. And then the next question is, how do you disconnect the terrorists from the people? So that in that school of fish, that one pops out, that's the bad guy. And so the people are connected to the terrorists in two ways, really. One way is because they're gaining some benefit from it. Or the other one is because they're afraid and they won't speak up. But as I, I've said before, everybody in the neighborhood knows where the crack house is. And the question is, how do you get uh, access to that 
without placing the people at risk uh, so that you can deal with the uh, terrorist elements in a reasonable manner. But that was the strategy that we pursued. Very, very simple. Everybody who came to Basilan was briefed this slide by me. Every airplane that came in, every ship that came in, and uh, 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 and the rotation of the SF guys, they obviously knew the strategy. But uh, that, that was a key requirement at the strategic level. And the commander's job really is strategic success. And we, there's a, t a tendency because we are good at tactics and ops. There's a tendency for senior leaders to get focused down too far. And the answer is you need to be thinking about the host country considerations. You need to be thinking about the country team and the chief of station. You need to be aware of Washington politics. You need to be aware of host nation politics. We've got a four-star commander you've got to keep happy. What does the population think is going on around them? Do they see it positively or not? Uh, what's the media and how are they going to spin this? And how do the members of your own JTF feel about what they're doing? Those are the things I think that are central to what the commander has to be thinking about uh, as he proceeds. So given this strategy then, um, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Frigo, who did an assessment that allowed us to determine what we should do in order to achieve those three objectives. So Frida, I'll hand off to you. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, hey, sorry, Major Lamb, I'm unmuted, right? Just checking. At the heart of this slide, we'll stay in the slide for just a minute. At the heart of the slide are two key elements for Special Forces uh, soldiers, and it's the environment and understanding the environment you're going to and the people who are in that environment. Could you go to the, uh, I think slide 13, is that right? The interesting part about the assessment is that we understood we'd been to Basilan uh, once or twice for just a couple of days in a mission that Donnie had alluded to uh, earlier. And we understood that we needed uh, a lot more in-depth understanding of <clears throat> this right side of this slide about the people and the environment. So we developed a tool, an actual assessment tool that really looked at how the uh, people view the government, how the people view the government forces uh, to include uh, the police, the special action forces and the military, how the people viewed their uh, elected officials, their uh, barangay and the village uh, chieftain and captains. And also we looked at hard assessment as to, and this came out of uh, experiences both in Bosnia and in Haiti, we looked at uh, pieces of the environment that might need infrastructure improvement. But it also allowed us to get in with a Philippine face. So we always went, again, no unilateral operations were allowed. Uh, we would always go with the Philippine soldiers uh, from that area, that brigade area, first and foremost, and we would together ask these questions. So it did two big, it did three big things. It allowed us to meet the key uh, leaders uh, of the communities. It allowed us to actually do the assessment and allowed us to show a bilateral approach with the Americans and the Filipinos together going back out. And it was astounding that, and it gave us the fourth piece, a benchmark of what the environment was like when we first found it. Our intent- Frito, Frito, Donnie yeah. here. Go ahead. Uh, Go back to slide three and step through the, the pieces you did in advance of um, where the government services were and where the population was and some of those things that led up to that. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, and, uh, on this map, I don't know if you see it, on this map, it's, it was all right around is, uh, Isabella uh, is, uh, and then Lamitan, the northern part, uh, the connective I think it's really only about uh, 12, mi uh, 12 miles between Zamboanga and the Straits of Basilan and Basilan. So the majority of the population is focused on the north and the northwestern side of the island. And then the further away you get like to Tipo and uh, Maluso, the very south uh, is more Muslim. And I remember Donnie Wooster and I going over there by uh, Mark V one time. And as we came into the port, Initially, you would see all of the uh, women grab the children and cover them up and the windows were closed. 
three months later, after we had taken this approach uh, in around the island, not just in the Christian side, the north and the western side of it, when we came in by boat or by helicopter, the kids were out waving at us. The women were holding the kids and you know everybody was a completely different environment. You could see it, you could feel it. We had started uh, the essence of change, but the demographics from this slide, you can clearly see uh, that it's mostly Christian again to the north. And that's really where the government forces stayed. They were not real thrilled about going around the edges of this island at all. Uh, and we said, no, nah, we've got to break out to all of this. And part of that was the secondary, what I thought was a secondary mission was to put a huge amount of military presence and pressure on the Abu Sayyaf group to get them, uh, either get them while they're on the island or get them to move to unfamiliar territory. And we can talk about that later. But understanding the demographics and where we were in the population because as you can see, it's a very mixed population down here, but it gets uh, to the slide, it, it, it gets uh, very Muslim oriented. I think 93%, both in all of Mindanao and this part of uh, Basilan for certain, 93% are Muslim. And it was interesting because up until about a month or so into this operation, the Philippine forces would openly tell Muslim jokes. In, in a very, quite honestly, using terms today in a very racist manner. And we finally, I finally talked to one of their key leaders, General Samatu. I, again, I'm still just a Colonel and expect to be most of my life just a Colonel. Uh, those are my happiest days, by the way. Uh, but talking to General Samatu about, you know, hey, look, don't believe because we're Americans that everybody in the crowd is a Christian. You, you kind of have to mind what's going on here. And he got that right away, even to the point that as we're leaving in June, I'm leaving physically at the end of June 2002, where he says, he asked me, do you know what the most important lesson you taught us? And I said, hey, sir, it's pretty profound. You're now a four star, I'm a colonel. Why don't you just answer the question for me? And he says, you taught us by your men's actions. And this, is, this reflects on 510, Donnie Wooster, and the RSOF and the SEALs and, and the, uh, the air, everybody understood this really critically that you taught us how to treat all of our people like all of our people. And that is, if that's not an American thing, I can't think of anything better or more uh, stronger compliment coming from a senior leader saying, look, we finally get this. These are our people too. We need to provide for them. And that's what was at the heart of the assessment. We could finally understand by going around to all these different areas uh, at some high risk, but to all these different areas and engaging people and asking them, what is it that you think you need? What is it that you think you want? Two different things. And we had no, Admiral Blair was very clear. You do not have a blank checkbook. You can't write checks. There's nothing you can promise. We go, we got that. And we did, we just said, we're just asking a question. And one of the key pieces of feedback that we got was, this is the very first time anybody ever asked us from the government, what can we do for you and really mean it. So this led to bringing it back to General Wooster and briefing it, this led to a series of projects around the entire island, uh, regardless of the population. It was, it didn't matter whether it was yellow or green, we went out here to do these things to make the place and to show one, the goodwill, but also the true intent. And then we would go back and look on a three month, six month basis, we would look to see how things are moving in terms of their perception of the force changed completely, uh, the perception of the government changed completely and the dynamic, if we could have weighted that equilateral triangle, the dynamic uh, and the severing of the ties between the population and the terrorists, it wasn't complete, but it was really starting to fray. So much so that they understood that uh, the Abu Sayyaf group understood that they no longer had populist support and had to leave the, uh, the uh, region. And, and can we go through the slides real quickly here, Chelsea? Sir, I'll jump in too, because I think what's interesting okay, about ahead, yeah. these slides is that, and gentlemen, is that, you know, I, I'm an Intel guy, you know, uh, former operator Intel guy now, and it's IPB, it's layering effect of all this data and information there. 
and I think it's, and I was defining things as it's what you know, what you think, and what you don't know. And hence the assessment was filling in those gaps of what we, what we didn't know on over there. And I think what's important is I view these slides and we had our discussion is, you know, in the counterinsurgency area, the people are the environment. It's, the, it's all about the people and so forth there. And you've been, for the audience, you start reading these slides, looking through it, look at the factors that were being looked at, the demographics of, you know, religion, demographics of, you know, of the support mechanisms uh, there, the population demographics, as General uh, Freedom is going to mention, you see where the population, you see where the government support is at and where it's not uh, on over there. And then you go, just go to the next slide here. And this is, you know, Don Sikorsky for you, you know, we used to joke that the, these groups, though we can define some borders, they are partnerships convenience. They don't wear patches. The ASG is going to support the MILF and whatnot there. And Don, for you, if you could bring up, was there a familiar tie with the ASG kidnappers that brought them back to Barcelona? Was Qaddafi John Jelani, Abu Sabaya, was that the rationale of why they came back to Barcelona? Yeah, uh, my, so Boston was like their base. They're, they're, uh, it was, it, it's where they got the support. It's why um, uh, General Friedovich is, and his guys, the assessment and, and what led you know, their actions and their outreach with, the, with their partners, what helped turn the situation in Boston. Um, Boston was their base of support. Um, it's where they had connections. It's where they had uh, support. It's where they frankly could live for the months it would take and have the support structure that they would need uh, while they waited for the uh, negotiations to ongo. So it was sanctuary. Um, you know, you can use the term safe haven. It was a place where they felt secure because they had the support of the populace. Um, not the entire populace, not the Christians up in the north, but in the interior and in the south, they had the support of the populace. And it's it's the wonderful work of uh, General Friedrich's guys that, that drove that wedge, right? And over time, they lost that support. But that's, that's why Barcelona, Barcelona was the center uh, for the ASG. That was the key. Thanks, there's a couple of there's a, a couple of anecdotes. One one is worth mentioning. If you're looking at the map of the island now. Those were the uh, Baran guys that uh, Fritos guys went to with the multi-page questionnaire, which are the next few slides, to find out from the people what they thought. They were chosen intentionally. Some of them were known hostile. Some of them were known friendly. Some of them we didn't really know what was what. But that was to get a sample on the island. But as you're looking at that map. The top left corner of that map really is Abu Sayyaf home territory. And uh, it's called Lantuan province. And the, uh, there are things that happen that you will have strategic impact that you don't even realize. A young Muslim woman brought her daughter to the American ODA who was camped there with Philippine soldiers. And she had a nasty fish hook wound or a fish hook wound in her leg, infected, going septic, and it was gonna, it was gonna threaten her life. And the 18 Delta, the team medic, took the child, cleaned up the wound, gave the mother some medicine, and said, if that pink isn't going away in a couple of days, you come back and see me again. And she left and did not come back, but it, it turns out that that little girl was the granddaughter of the grand imam of Lantuan. And he put out word that nothing bad happens to any American in Lantuan. And that place was quiet the entire time we were there. So there are, granted, there are gonna be Hatfields and McCoys wherever you go, who will be happy to use the Americans to punish their enemies. So you have to strategically be aware of that. But some things that uh, will just happen in the course of normal, uh, American soldier and, and uh, uh, our perceptions and way of life uh, rub off on these people and it surprises. Them. You know, it, it surprised. There's one guy, one young man that was shot by some Filipinos and immediately the American pararescue went to work on him to save his life, which wasn't the standard, but that those things are noticed by people. And as Frito said, when uh, when we first went down to the island, every place you went, people would make a slashing with their hand across their throat. Um, and in a, it took about three months, like he said, but everybody waved after that. And 
the, those those things you can't really quantify, but that one that, that one medics treatment of that little girl was um, operationally very significant. So thank you. Thanks, sir. So, sir, the, the assessments take place. Uh, we have the next few slides. So you can kind of see the examples of the, the assessments here, kind of what we're, what the, the ODAs and the embeds are asking and so forth there. To kind of roll through these here, we'll go to kind of the map of the results. Um, there, next slide. Yeah. So, gentlemen, General Wooster, General Friedovich, were any surprises on the results uh, there from what we kind of knew in our early assessment to kind of what kind of came back and how that helped focus the future uh, engagement, sir, of kind of uh, how the strategy of kind of going to kind of answer uh, the results of this the, the survey. Let, hey, Donnie, let go, go ahead. Yeah, let me talk to this chart first. When Frito's guys went out there, they would ask questions and they would, they would gut check yes or no, and then they would give a score, uh, zero being bad, five being good. And so if you look at the, what they got, this was never briefed back to the people, the best of my knowledge, Frito can correct me if that's wrong, but we took it to say, okay, here is what, that people think based on what his ODA has brought back. And if you look at uh, medical care access, which is the white circle, you look on the Southwest part of the island, zero, zero, zero. There is no medical care down there. And we saw everything there from scabies to, to leprosy. And uh, if you go through the legend there and look at the different things, did the people trust the government? Did lack of water, we knew it would be huge. Uh, two kids a day died on Basilon from bad water. And so we said, okay, knowing what we know now about this, we know that there are certain things that the people will really react to. So next slide. So then we took that data and laid it against the line of operation. How do we connect the government to the people knowing what we know on the island and that list up above? Water, medical care. Confidence in government was a, a polite way not to save corruption. Uh, fixing the road so they could get to market, so they could travel safely without being intercepted by Abu Sayyaf. And the ports were both shot, so they couldn't import uh, any goods. So we said, okay, those are things we should do to connect the people to the government. Next slide of operation, next slide. How does Frito's guys help them? You, you wanna walk through this one, Frito? Obviously, there were some big gaps. We did assessments with the units that we were with. We had one ODA and the work SEAL team with uh, every battalion all the way around the island. And one of our commitments to them, because they said, you guys can't go to the island. You're not going to live. We said, hey, we're going to we're going to eat the food you uh, you eat. Uh, we'll prepare it ourselves and all that. It'll be safe. But we're going to live the way you live and we're going to work the way you work. We're going to be with you every step of the way. And one of the big things to be said is we're not going to drink the water. That's one of the things that we won't do. And you shouldn't probably drink the water either, which is Donnie's point earlier. But we went through all of this and we saw some gaps and we were very kind of gentle about this because they, were very, they are a very proud professional force. So we took our time and really started working and integrating ourselves into Ops Intel Fusion and to take a look about, again, uh, what we know, what we didn't know, uh, to Mike's point, and to look at really analyzing what we're all looking at and do we have a shared vision and how we get there is completely different. We reorganized some of it, but we trained together. And we also thought that the heart of what we do in special forces is the uh, heavy reliance and use on senior NCOs and junior NCOs to carry out those tasks uh, to the standard. And I think General Wooster might share a story later on about going to different places and seeing primary marksmanship and being I guess, nicely amazed that it was the same way everywhere he went. We also had 24 hour, uh, hour uh, air mobility and evacuation and that was key. It gives them a lot of confidence to do more than just you know working a little bit from being solar powered from sunrise to sunset. It gives them a, a more opportunity. And we had real good conversations about do guys die of wounds because you can't get them evacuated. And if you have air, you need to have the maritime piece too. And just bringing this whole thing together to do the work that we know how to do and have been doing it for a long time. And SOC Pack 510 was key in being able to integrate the staff level and showing how uh, the partnership and the horizontal vertical integration of what we do, what we know how to do and to work asatna alongside of them. And then leveraging the ROE. It was a, there's a big factor having Americans with the Filipinos 
and we heard this more than once, sadly, a lot of the frontier justice stopped. They used to, in the maritime, they would stop boats at sea and they would take some of the fish that a fisherman had caught as a t informal tax. That stopped. Uh, Any time in an incident like that, the ROE said we would report it at great risk. And later on in life, this happened a little bit more frequently. And we never hesitated to go right back up the chain of command. And we said, hey, we can't stop it. We at least have to report it. They understood that we are a, a, a legally based uh, uh, and honest force. And then that was also part of that discussion or that, that point I made earlier, but very mission focused. One of the conversations General Wooster and I had were, when do we need to bring, because of the cap on people, the psychological operations and the civil military operation people forward. Those guys, those men and women are worth their weight in gold. We finally got them forward at the expense of some of my slots. And I think that was the best investment we could have made because it opened up this entire program of communications to the population, but also to be able to start some of these major projects around the island to include the wells, the port uh, enhancement and the all weather road around the island. Yeah, one of the one of the things that was worthwhile, we formed a, uh, a it's essentially a, a staff meeting where the JTF 510 elements would stand up and brief their readiness. They'd say, here's the air readiness, here's the ground readiness, here's the maritime readiness, and here's what the Naval Construction Task Group is. And then sitting next to me was Philippine commander, and I turned to him and said, Howard, can we get your forces to brief? Because they, they didn't, believe it or not, the way they did joint planning was not the air component coordinating with the ground component, coordinating with the maritime component. The Philippines has one military cat and everybody for each service goes there. So Army, Navy, and Air Force are all classmates in the Philippines. And so if they, if they wanted to run a joint operation where they needed ship, ships or air support, believe it or not, they would call their classmates in the, in the other services and they would just coordinate what they were going to do at that level. There was no formal joint uh, interface. And so when we started demonstrating how we did it, pretty soon they were briefing their readiness and the, uh, the users could then get with the capability providers and say, well, we need you to do this. We need security on such and such while we do so and so. And so that was, I think, uh, enlightening for them. It would take a generation of work to make that fully functional. but they saw how we uh, conduct the joint operations and planning, which I think was very valuable. And I think that's a great point. And I, I know, Jennifer, you mentioned your force has dealt with this. The Marines and Island are competing with the Army. There was crossing the battle space prior for you guys getting there uh, and so forth. And I think that, that's very interesting. I also want to capitalize on the comment about the medevac, sir. I know in talking to the ODAs uh, on that, that they you know, said that was huge for the Philippines to get confidence and the combat lifesaver training. I know we'll talk about that later. But that combat lifesaver training and the medical equipment just to do that battlefield triage gave them confidence um, to basically go forward and, and kind of do the things we, we would want them to do. And Jennifer, push to your point, it's about the host nation kind of uh, doing the, the operation by, you know, a U.S. Right. Uh, forward base. base and a great example of the success of that, Mike, was one of those combat lifesaver soldiers uh, who was trained by his ODA teammate uh, saved Gracia Burnham's life because she was shot in the thigh with a serious wound. Um, the, the, the first time, because they generally would stop at about three o'clock, because if one of their guys was wounded after three o'clock, there wasn't time to get word out, get the helicopter down from the north to fly in and evacuate the guy before dark. So if he got wounded after three o'clock, they would have to sit with him all night long, maybe him bleeding out. And so they tended to stop at three o'clock. And as we as they gained confidence in us, we said, no, no, stay after them. And so there was a firefight. One guy got hit with a 762 round, uh, was hit pretty bad in the pelvis. And our 60s flew over and got him and brought him back and put him in the hospital, treated him. And he came out of surgery. And I went over to visit him. And I said, gave him a phone and said, here, call your friends and tell them you're okay. And that, that kind of thing rockets through that force that if you get hurt, they're going to take care of you. So that I think that was uh, one of the, it, again, one of those relatively small things that has 
large impact. There you go. Okay, so this was the last leg. How do you disconnect the people from the terrorists? Either they're colluding with them because they're getting something out of it, or they're afraid of them and they won't talk. But what I found in 40 years in the military is that, you know, parents all want the same thing. They want their kids to worship God in the way of their fathers. They want them to be educated. They want them to be healthy and they want them to be safe. And so uh, if you are in this type of environment and you are doing those types of things uh, that have the, that result, the, the, the people are gonna look at you positively. So uh, next slide. One of the things we did was MedCats and we intentionally targeted them in the southeastern portion of the island and the western portion of the island, the areas that were in rebellion. And it was like a carnival. And what we found uh, was that sometimes Abu Sayyaf members would come to the MedCap. They'd leave their guns in the jungle and they would come to the MedCap. And uh, they came up to me and said, sir, what should we do? I said, treat them. And, uh, uh, you know, they, it, it was sort of a carnival event and uh, very positively regarded. The lower picture on the lower right there is uh, dental work being done by Philippine dentists. But I found out the most effective piece of a med cap is the dentist because you walk in hurting and you walk out not hurt. And, uh, uh, you know, we, at the end of these, we'd have a quarter of a five gallon bucket full of teeth. And, you know, that we'd have put a $50 filling in. But um, those med caps were extremely effective. As a matter of fact, one of the Abu Sayyaf guys wanted to come and take pictures with me. And I said, frisk him and bring him over here. I'll take a picture with him. So uh, very positive outreach and always with the Philippine face on it. This was probably one of the most dramatic things. Um, what we found out from the assessment was mobility on the island was awful. So people had rubber trees, they had coconut stuff and, and they couldn't get to market. And we went down and gave out a thousand hammers. Hey, Donnie. Yeah. Just real quick, just uh, this is a, a plug. Bacillin is very fertile because it used to have, volcan it's got volcanic soil. It has for the coffee drinkers, if you ever have a chance, it has got <laughs> getting the best coffee uh, in that part of the world. And, but getting it to market, over to you, Donnie, getting it to yeah. market was problematic. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Frito. Um, so we, we've, after about April, uh, we went in January, after about April, we got approval to bring more people on the island. And we bought about, uh, before that, we were only allowed to have 160 people on the island. And I had put them all on full per diem and we didn't put up tents. We hired locals to do neat huts. Uh, we contracted with the widows to do the laundry. Um, the, all the food was provided locally for the teams. So we invested about $3 million into the island uh, in fairly short order. And the roads were horrible. And I now know more about road building than I ever thought I would need to. But um, we went down to the island and we gave out a thousand hammers because to make a, a decent road in that environment, you need about six inches of crushed two and a half inch aggregate, and then need about six inches of topsoil on top of it. And so that guy sitting down there at the lower right has got a hammer that was provided to him, and he is breaking that rock into two and a half inch aggregate, making a dollar a day. And the picture with the bulldozers pushing that stuff, we bought 6,000 dump trucks, 6,000 dump trucks of crushed two and a half inch aggregate in about two months. And so every, there were, you could not go on the island and shut the engine off and not hear somebody going tink, 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 tink. And, uh, and I, I, is my picture up? If it is, give me a thumbs up, Frida. Can you see my picture? Okay. I was on the island the last day. And I, I drove by, the last day I was there, I was going back to change of command. And I drove by one of these guys breaking rock. And I said to myself, I've got to have one of those hammers. So I said, stop the vehicle. So we, they stopped the vehicle. I get out, I, I take a $20 bill out of my pocket. And I walk over to this guy and said, I'd like to buy your hammer for $20. <laughs> and, you know, that exchange took place about this fast. And, uh, and I have this hammer, which was, that was done 
in the space of about six weeks in break and rock, all of which we bought back, put on the roads, which was the road that was gonna take his children to the new schools we're building. It was gonna take his family to the clinic that, we're fix, that we were uh, fixing in the region. And it was gonna take his goods to market. And the roads got so good uh, that they were flying down with 50 miles an hour. And, and our biggest problem became automobile accidents. And if it used to be on a five mile an hour mud road that if an Abu Sayyaf guy stepped out in front with a gun, they'd stop and he'd have them. Now they would just run over, you know, blast them through there 50 or 60 miles an hour. So uh, that, that was a, a, a great satisfaction. Rate. But in that naval construction task group, we teamed up with Philippine engineering battalions and found out they had some guys that really could operate that equipment. They knew dump trucks, they knew graders. And, uh, uh, and so we said, you know, let them operate the machines, particularly around the villages. So the people see their own military building a road to help them. And our, our only problem was they, they were fearless and they would go blasting through the security perimeter and grade another five miles of road. And we'd wonder if they were gonna make it back, but they'd come back and, and it, was a, it was a great success in terms of the people observing it. When we rebuilt a couple of hospitals, put in about 35 hand pump wells um, and uh, the, the head doctor at the Lamitan Hospital said later, he said, you know, I thought that when the Americans came, I was going to have a bunch of gunshot victims to treat. And instead, I got a new hospital. And that, you know, when you look at the, the strategic investment of what the United States put into that effort for what we got out, uh, it's huge. And Frito's guys brought the readiness of the Philippine forces up dramatically. Um, as he said, there's no shortage of courage or patriotism in our partners. And uh, their combination of human and our technical capabilities for overhead imagery and, and uh, uh, ISR are fairly significant. Mike, you, you could tell a couple stories right now if you want to about the chicken and sky pebbles. Yeah, yes, sir. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think sky pebbles is an interesting story and about ping pong balls. Uh, there. So, sir, why don't you kind of share with our, 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 our audience uh, kind of how we kind of brought in, what was it, 30,000 ping pong balls and kind of the, the background behind that and kind of the genesis of both stories. You've got, we talked about the roasted chickens and that, how we kind of uh, came from the staff, really, like you said, major and below were kind of innovators to kind of answer some problems. The, the, the Abu Sayyaf would, would write out and say, we, I want rubber boots and a Rambo knife and a G-Shock watch and need some new pants. And so the Philippine military through an intermediary would get this request and they would, they would try to follow the supply chain back to find the bad guys. And, um, uh, and we said, you know, we can maybe help. We've got some overhead capability. So when the drop happens, we can follow the guy. He'll get in the tuk-tuk and drive someplace and they'll change tuk-tuks and they'll drive someplace else. And we can follow it with our sensors and uh, we'll tell you where he's going. Well, in the end, he'd get out of the tuk-tuk and walk into the market. He would always disappear. There was just too many people in the market. We couldn't see him. And one of the young majors on the front row said, you know, next time they ask for something, we need to give them a pizza because we can see it with the infrared. It's hot and it's big. And we said, okay, let's, let's do that. So we, uh, the next time a request came out, we went to get a pizza and we found out they don't sell pizza in Zamwango, but they sell roast chickens. And roast chickens are big and hot and they will hold heat for a long time. So, uh, you know, they did the drop, the guy got the stuff, got in the tuk-tuk, went to another tuk-tuk, got in the market, disappeared. We lost him, said, watch the access, watch the access. And, and so pretty soon, here comes that three pound roast chicken walking down the pier to get in a boat to go up to Sirawak. And so we followed the boat up to Sirawai, and that's where they were. That's how we found them, with a roast chicken. And uh, uh, we rehearsed this with the Echo, Echo 160 of guys. They had all, had all rented dirt bikes over at the air base. And so prior <laughs> to us doing this, we had them go around the base, and we were basically following, following the chicken on over there, yeah. which was point. It took about two weeks to, to get all this kind of done, but it was definitely innovative. And then, of course, the ping pong balls that we were going to drop on the island, that was this whole other story yeah. there. Yeah. So we're coming to kind of the, the end of our kind of format here. Um, 
I, I you know, sir, amazing, you know, mission. It was a pleasure to serve, but it didn't come up without some loss. I mean, we, we had, you know, unfortunately kind of lost some great Americans during this, uh, during this, 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 this time. And, you know, and, and Chelsea, you want to put up that slide, um, you know, just kind of a little bit of remembrance. We take a little moment of silence and then Randy, who wouldn't mind just kind of reading off those that we kind of lost during, uh, during OFP. Uh, absolutely, Mike. There were, there were several service members killed. I'd like to take a moment of silence to read their names. Major Curtis Feisner, Captain Bart Owens, CW2 Jody Egnor, Staff Sergeant James Doherty, Staff Sergeant Kerry Frith, Staff Sergeant Bruce Rushforth Jr., Sergeant Jeremy Forshee, Specialist Thomas Allison, and the two airmen were Master Sergeant William McDaniel II and Staff Sergeant Juan Redow, uh, Sergeant First Class Mark Wayne Jackson. Thank you. So I believe this time it moves into our format for questions and answers. Uh, do we have any questions out there for this great panel of experts? Yes, we've received quite a few questions actually. So I'm going to start with um, many Americans did not understand how the Philippines had a direct impact for the hunt of Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. How is OEFP relevant? The Secretary of Defense, Secretary Rumsfeld at the time, envisioned that in response to the 9 11 attacks, he envisioned that we would be a, a global simultaneous strike on Al Qaeda around the world. Uh, the operational prep of the battlefield and intelligence prep did not account for that. Um, Al Qaeda was connected to Abu Sayyaf because some of the uh, Southern Philippine Muslim men had gone to Afghanistan as Mujahideen during the Russian time period and had established the connections to Osama bin Laden and others. Uh, Khalifa, uh, Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law was in the Philippines uh, at the time and was responsible for other terrorist activity. The connection between Jim Aslamiya and Abu Sayyaf was one that was not really detected yet. Maria Ressa wrote a great book about that, by the way, if you want to read it. But um, what the secretary is looking for was global activity counter Al Qaeda. And we said, well, we can't give you targets to hit. These are sovereign countries, but Abu Sayyaf is connected to Al Qaeda. They've got then two Americans hostage, and uh, but it's not a hit; it's a campaign. And the secretary was quite frankly not convinced that it should be done. He was not a big fan of a nation-building type approach or a partner-building type approach. He was a kinetic guy, and as a matter of fact, the one time he was asked about it, he said. Uh, well, we're not killing many terrorists in the Philippines. Uh, and there was a great response. Uh, the book Imperial Grunts was in uh, preparation by a famous author named Robert Kaplan. And Robert Kaplan saw that comment and he had spent a month in the Southern Philippines and uh, wrote a memo to the Secretary of Defense that I have a copy of that basically laid out, you know, I was just down there for a month in the Southern Philippines and while you're not, you know, you may not be killing many terrorists, you're only winning. And, uh, and that was, it was just a, a difference in, in mindset. The, uh, in SOCPAC's region, when, you, when they came out with the top 10 Al-Qaeda hit list right after 9-11, one of them was in the Pacific, it was in Thailand. Hams Raji Saleh was his name. And, uh, and he was rolled up fairly short order. So, uh, and, and, you know, the question is, you got a military, do you want to use it or not? And how does it contribute to the national security of what's going on? Uh, what we are interested in, and we believe we succeeded at, was we did not provide an opportunity for them to have sanctuary in the southern Philippines without being at risk. And so if you look at Afghanistan, and I'm going to editorialize here a little bit. If you look at Afghanistan, why did we go to Afghanistan? We went to Afghanistan so that enemies of our nation would not have the sanctuary they would need to plan against us. And, and we have succeeded at that. And whether or not we leave, we are so connected through that infrastructure, we could pick people off from distance if we wanted to. So 
similarly in Iraq, uh, we, uh, we went there because we were concerned that there might be weapons of mass destruction. That's a, an issue of contention depending on which group you're in. But I, when I went, I certainly thought I was at risk of being gassed. And so that threat is gone. And so the, the operations that we've done in the Middle East have succeeded in the primary national objectives. And the operations in the Southern Philippines were about denying sanctuary, which we did. Good question. I've got, I've got Mike real quickly. One thing that we didn't talk about, but I'll, but I'll add, it's, it's mildly adjacent uh, to the connected to this is that it took a great, and Donnie had talked about this earlier, it took a great amount of constraint not to be kinetic. Uh, and to talk to a bunch of special forces soldiers who were leaning forward to go down there to go pull triggers and reorient them to, no, nah, we're not doing that. We're smarter than that. We're better than that. We're disciplined. And it's going to take a lot longer time. But when we leave, it's sustainable by them. And that was a key also strategic factor that when we left and we knew we were leaving sooner or later, that the impact would be there forever and it wouldn't be a sucking sound. And that took a huge amount of professionalism and discipline to achieve that. Well, that's a great point. I know me being a direct action guy coming to Sock Pack, we felt that same way. And sir, you educated me, John Lewis, there that goes the approach that I took back from my time at Sock Pack to going back to the National Mission Force that regional engagement, engagement matters for the long term. So huge, huge lesson learned there. Any other questions, Chelsea? Yeah, kind of on that note, uh, one member of our team is formy, former Army Civil Affairs, and she asked, in 2002, most of the civil affairs assets were in the U.S. Army Reserve. It sounds like you were doing a lot of civil affairs activities. Did you have a civil affairs team with you? Yeah, we did. And, uh, um, and I attached them to the ODAs. To the dismay of the civil affairs people, I would not let them take a Humvee and operate with two people. I said, you move with the ODA. The ODA is there for your security and depth. And the last thing we want is to give the bad guys the opportunity to claim a victory by hurting an American. And uh, two people in a Humvee is not as intimidating as a bristling ODA moving down a, a roadway. So I kept those last together, which was not doctrinal, but I also recall that in the early days of both Iraq and Afghanistan, some of our highest casualty rates were amongst civil affairs people who were out there doing the courageous work that they do. And I did not want that to occur. So I, I altered uh, their doctrinal employment slightly for their security. Along those lines, we had, we had learned lessons in Haiti and in Bosnia that when you uh, bring PSYOPs, uh, elements, civil affairs elements and ODAs together, uh, the main effort changes, the Venn diagram changes, but you uh, attain this phenomenal amount of synergy when they are operating together. Uh, they own the same battle space. There's a, certainly a security element to it, but they achieve, achieve much greater success when they are lashed all together. Great, thank you. Um, we'll make time for one more. Uh, what were some of the challenges and benefits of working with the local um, AFP military in the Philippines? Well, the obvious, uh, the obvious piece is quite a few of them had spent a lot of considerable amount of time uh, on in Mindanao. Uh, I, they counted Mindanao deployments the way a lot of units count deployments to Afghan have kind of deployments to Afghanistan, and they would mark how many years that they had been down there. So they had phenomenal. Uh, local knowledge. Uh, so that was a, a big piece of it. Uh, and, you know, they had lived in and operated in jungles. They had their obvious constraints, but we were uh, allowed to leverage some of the technology that we brought to minimize and or neutralize some of those constraints. And, and besides, one of the big benefits was to get our guys exposed to a different culture and a different method of operation. So we told them uh, frequently that we're getting as much out of this as you are in terms of what we learn. And that's the way we'd like to have it. It, it wasn't a J-sit per, per se, where we get 51% of the benefit, but there were days where we learned quite a bit from these guys uh, and, and they did a la combat lifesaver and a few other things from us. So it was a real partnership. And I think that was the key benefit. 
the partnership that we had with them and that we would bear the same hardships they bore and we would live the way they lived and we were there for the long haul in a strategic uh, and an operational manner. Donnie? You're, You're muted, muted, sir. You're muted? Sorry, sorry. One of the other benefits that came from that relationship was if I needed to berm uh, a camp for security of our special forces soldiers, the Philippine military that were there also benefit. If I had to drill a well to give them clean water, that will be there after we go. Uh, if I had to repair a, a you know, a, a full septic tank or build a latrine, then that entire battalion and that ODA was there with would benefit from it. So the other thing is, as soon as we drilled a well, we run a pipe outside the wire and uh, the kids who normally had to walk a, like a kilometer to get a bucket of water for their family for the day would migrate to the camp. And soon they're talking to the Americans and the Philippine soldiers and pretty soon their parents show up and everybody uh, gets to talking. And like I said earlier, in the neighborhood, everybody knows where the crack house is. And that, that connection to the population was really what bumped the Abu Sayyaf off the island. And because of the publicity provided to the restrictions that we had, they knew where we were not allowed to go. And they took a boat and went all the way there. Uh, and we figured out with the chicken later where they were. And the uh, Philippine military went up there to engage them. And I sent Frito up to have a look at it and give, have them give a hand. But it was beyond where we were technically supposed to go. Good question. Thanks, sir. So, gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our session here. And I wish we had more time to talk, and I could talk for hours about this and get caught up with everybody. But closing out, sir, some lessons learned on this. I mean, you, you mentioned it during the first question, though. This was part of a larger campaign. We were a small part of a large campaign to deny sanctuary safe haven for, you know, terrorist organizations, ASG, AS, um, Al-Qaeda, Jamaz al there. How do you see this kind of, and what lessons learned can we take on looking at the future challenges of great power competition? Well, the, in terms of the Chinese, their intent is to become the global hegemon. Um, and the Russians still have the combat power to, you know, decimate our society. So uh, the Russians don't appear to me to be as expansionist as the Chinese, who are willing to exploit the natural resources to deplete them and infringe on the sovereignty of other nations. And uh, so the question is, how do we thwart their efforts in Africa? How do we thwart their efforts in South America? And uh, because neither of us want to come to blows, but there is strategic competition that's going to go on. The economic competition that the previous administration established um, hurt them. I mean, we had to wait to get something at Walmart for a week. But my impression is that the Chinese felt that economic impact much more significantly than us. They're very capable people. They're very proud and nationalistic. Um, they do not share our democratic values as is evidenced by what they're doing in uh, Hong Kong and, and Taiwan. I don't know what will come of it, uh, but uh, they are shrewd enough to target strategic minerals and other things that they know will influence our ability to project combat power. Um, they may underestimate us a little bit in that we are ingenious in workaround. So I think that part of our great value of our unconventional warfare forces, their mobility, their intelligence, and uh, uh, their readiness is that uh, we can complicate their planning efforts globally. You know, for instance, if we have F-22s that can disappear. What if they uncloak in a place that they didn't think they could be? You know, that's a, that's a strategic impact that suddenly enters their calculus and holy smokes, you know. I don't know if you watched, but AFSOC not too long ago, um, using an MC-130, uh, ejected Alcom shapes uh, out the back of an airplane, which means you can take a town which can fly at 200 feet at night through the threat in the weather. and uh, deliver cruise missiles from any quadrant. Right. And that is a strategic uh, calculation uh, 
complicator. So I think that we have great relevance uh, in terms of what we can do with uh, great power struggles. But you know, the, the, to me, the largest one is economic power. We do not want to come to blows with the Chinese. And we do not want to come to blows with the Russians, I don't think. And so the question is, how do we win without fighting? Which is what this whole deployment was about. Pick a good strategy, target the right lines of operation as a nation, not just as a military, but as a nation to complicate their calculus and uh, prevent them from being able to say, today, we could do it today. We want them to say, eh, not today. We're not, we're not there yet. In the meantime, of course, we want to develop all sorts of stuff in the black that will surprise them on day one if they do do something probably. So that's, those are my opinions as a 40 year veteran. <laughs> and I trust the people we got there are, are smart enough to execute well, but the idea of 5,000 mile uh, line of communication does not appeal to me in the Pacific. Mike, just real, real quickly to that. Uh, I think the relevance of this mission has to do with a strategic view and a long-term view and staying on course. Uh, and if you look at the Chinese and if you read the 100 year marathon by Pillsbury and, and books like that, they have a long view. This mission when it started and the assessment that we did that Donnie referred to in the classified uh, uh, note, mental note, we talked to Denny Bl Admiral Blair and he said, honestly, how long do you think it's gonna take to make a difference? We said, a small task force, a lot longer, larger task force, shorter amount of time, but either way, 10 to 14 years. And that's about how long it took to achieve lasting effect. And I think that's one of the key components to the notion behind this mission is you have to have the same constant gaze and assess how you're doing and where you're going. And you're going to make course corrections, but stay into that goal to the end. And I think that's also part of the real I think relevance and power behind this mission. Thank you, sir. Well, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. This brings us to the conclusion of our Soft Stories Live Joint Task Force 510 in the Philippines. On behalf of the Global Soft Foundation, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you for your service to our nation, for kindly sharing your personal experience with our viewers. It was an honor to have served with all of you. Randy, back to you. Thank you, Mike. I, I really appreciate that. And gentlemen, uh, thank you for your distinguished service and, and, and particularly what you did during uh, Joint Task Force 510. It, it, it's sincerely appreciated. And, and thanks for the uh, very candid uh, conversation. We look forward to having you join us and our distinguished guests again in April for our next topic to be announced. Until then, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation and Soft Stories Live, thank you. With special thanks to my associate, Chief Sergeant, uh, Command Sergeant Major Rick Lamb. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to demote you uh, there, uh, CSM. Uh, retired yeah, former Ranger in Green Beret. I am the host Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force Retired Air Commando. Good afternoon and God bless America. <laughs>